Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I asked myself what should I speak about? Because government policies are for government ministers. Prime Minister sets it. I thought perhaps you might find useful if I gave you my thoughts on what I would do if I had my life to live all over again. Supposing I was born in 1973, not 1923, <laughs> and that I'm 21 years old and undergraduate. Same genes, therefore same natural endowments, same makeup, temperament, but a different upbringing because 73 to 94 were years of calm, stability, growth, growing prosperity. 23 to 44 were tumultuous years. In order to understand your generation, I try to fathom not my children because they are already 15, 20 years older than you, but my grandchildren has a difficult task. A university lecture of about 40 summed up for me as how do I improve my career and increase my income year by year so that the good life I aspire to can be reached as soon as possible? What would I do now? I would say I would want to take a career which would give me options because you cannot foretell what openings the future will have. So I would go for an SAF overseas scholarship or an overseas merit scholarship as the first step. Because what you want in life and this is what I wanted and I set out to get it is a passport you can flash and that gets you through the door once you're through the door you're then tested on your merits but you must get through the door first and the other thing you must have in life is a network of friends of being part of an old boy network and if you take an SAF scholarship or an overseas merit scholarship you are one of about 50 each year. So whenever you write your CV, and in Singapore, as I intend to stay in Singapore, that is important. Any minister, any civil servant, any judge looks through your CV and says, ah, one of 50 for that year. That's important. And eight years working together, you get to know how the system works, your friends in key places, and they will rise. 20 years later, they are in key strategic locations. All you do is pick up the phone, your name, you're through. You are DBS scholars, ah, short term calculator. <laughs> So, what would I do if I got the scholarship? I think if I were good with my hands, I would do engineering. Maybe in today's trend, I might do electronic engineering as a basis because that's the future, supercomputers, superhighways, internet, databases. Not to spend my life on it, but to have a good grounding. Of course, after that, I would want to take an MBA. Because you don't want to be an engineer or a research, researcher in the lab all your life. Where would I go? Oxbridge? Well, 
If I had a grandfather, if I'm born like 23 and a grandfather like me, 70 years old or 71, he would have sentimental ties with Oxbridge because it's the Cambridge of the 1940s was a gracious place and uh, an institution of great scholarship and learning. But born in 2050, no, 73, and facing it, a choice in 89, I would say no. I would go to America because the Americans will have a big role in Asia. The British have a role in Europe, marginally maybe in other parts of the world. And I have to understand the Americans. So it's not just learning uh, data, it's networking. I would choose a West Coast University like Stanford, or an East Coast one like Harvard or Princeton or Yale. <clears throat> and if I go for my undergraduate or my first degree there, I would go for an MBA later in Europe, either France in Anciard or in G Geneva, Imed. Then I understand also the Europeans. Or if I'm good at my Chinese and I pick up some Japanese, I'd spend a year with the Japanese. It's the hard facts of life. Who will be relevant in this part of the world in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? And there's a cultural lag we suffer from. The PSC suffer from, suffers from it. Parents suffer from it. Many of our students are still being sent to Oxbridge and top British universities. Well, I've told the PSC, I said, I spoke to the chairman about five, six years ago. I said, we ought to do something about this because we must have people who can deal with U.S. Senators, U.S. Congressmen because they are the people who come around this part of the world, not British MPs. Suppose I don't, didn't get a scholarship, what would I do? And my parents can't send me. Then I'll sit down and do a hard think. If I'm really confident that I'm a practical chap with the hands, I would do engineering and then later do an MBA in Harvard or Stanford or whatever. But if I'm not, then I would consider the law because that gives me an opening and again I would do an MBA in America. Now, I cannot overemphasize the importance of knowing people. I give you this illustration. I spent one term in Harvard, less than a term, not to do any specific course, just to understand Americans. And they tailored a course to suit whatever I wanted to know. I had a graduate student attached to me to run errands, go to the library, uh, get things for me, work things out, fix up seminars with economists, with sociologists, and so on. In the process, I met a whole series of people who later became very important. One of them was Henry Kissinger, before he was National Security Advisor and later Secretary of State. So we had met in an informal setting. He had heard my views of Vietnam and the American commitment already made. And it coincided with his. And we became lifelong friends. So that one visit, just over two months, in the autumn of 1968, gave me a network. And from Henry Kissinger, and uh, people like John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, 
Rich Dick Newstead, who was a specialist on American presidencies, I was able to reach out, use their network, and fan out. Whereas in Britain, I have deep connections. As a student, I was a member of the British Labour Club in Cambridge University. I campaigned for the, my fellow students in the elections in the British Labour Party. I became a protégé, so to speak, of the British Labour Party. And I have friends right across. And because we were good friends. Therefore, in Malaysia, 63 to 65, when tensions were acute, there were very severe constraints on the central government as to any high-handed use of emergency powers on the Singapore government. Because my reach went not only into the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson and his cabinet, but into the British Parliament and across into the Conservative Party. But alas, all that investments now is worth less because the British have withdrawn or rather sh shrunken their interests primarily to Europe. Now, what would I do with my language skills? I think it's important that you know the English language because it is the international language and you speak it in a standard form. Do not speak Singlish. <laughs> if you do, you are the loser. Only foreign academics like to write about it. You have to live it. And your interlocutors, when they hear you, their ears go askew. <laughs> you detract from the message that you are sending them. I don't have to speak with an English upper class accent, but I speak in a way which makes it easy for them to understand me, and therefore they are not distracted by my background. My message goes through without wrong wrappings. I would learn Chinese. For years, I spent mastering the language. I still do. Every week, I sit down with a lecturer at the Institute of Education, who is Chinese. We sit down. We, he keeps up my idiom. Till today, I cannot speak idiomatic Chinese. I am translating from my English sentences into Chinese. So, it's a price I paid. Because I knew that, I sent my children to Chinese schools. They don't suffer from my defect. They can construct sentences either the Chinese form or the English form, because they started young. Of course, parents, until the recent opening up of China, were against it. Uh, too much trouble. But it's a lifelong facility which will be of enormous value, economic value. Then I would learn Malay, perhaps the Indonesian pronunciation. Without Malay, my whole relationship with President Suharto might have been different. I would have had to sit down with an interpreter. Fortunately for me, I started off with Bazaar Malay. I polished up during my political years and learned all the, uh, the suffixes and the prefixes. and I'm able to communicate and talk directly to him with nobody else present. Therefore, no embarrassment. Put propositions which, if unacceptable, dies. If acceptable, takes off. What he calls a four-eye meeting. 
and we live in this region, therefore I think it's a value to have it. And as I said, if my Chinese were good enough, I would pick up Japanese. Because they are going to be a very important source of technology and finance. They may be undergoing difficulties at the moment, but I'm absolutely convinced that they are going to be become one of the leading industrial or post-industrial nations in the next 50 years, maybe longer. Now, <clears throat> after I've done eight years bond, what do I do? That will bring me about 2005, two years NS, eight years bond. I think I moved to a stat board or a GLC with projects in the region because this region is going to grow and grow for the next 20, maybe 30 years. But I would want to keep my links with the admin service because I want to keep my in touch with the center because that is the heart of government and is useful whether I stay in the private sector or if I can catch the eye of uh, PAP recruiters, <laughs> I become an MP and later a minister. It's a very long range kind of investments that I would make not for short-term benefits, a kind of investments which yields dividends next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I'm talking, of course, if I were born myself, you know, top 2, 3 percent of my cohort. Suppose I'm not, I'm only in the top 15 percent. I got only two Bs and two Cs. Perhaps might make a lower second then what would I do? I think I leave you to ask these questions and I'll answer them. <laughs> but I would move my targets to more realistic heights and maximize on what I have. Now what do I do with my own personal life? I'm about 28 or 30 I would want to get married. Now there are two ways of looking at marriage. The present generation is affected by Western uh, myth, love, <laughs> marriage, <laughs> divorce. My father and mother married each other because their two parents got together and decided they were a good match. So you either have the Western view, you marry the woman you love, or the Eastern view, you love the woman you marry. <laughs> Well, I tried to match both. <laughs> and I think it wasn't a bad choice. <laughs> but it is absolutely crucial, and I'm saying this not because uh, the single figures for gra female graduates are, are very bad, but, <laughs> but for very practical reasons. I would want to marry an equal or somebody better than I because it's an enormous advantage for the rest of my life. She can carry the load as much as I can. And most important of all, not only the income is double, <laughs> if anything happens to me, particularly when I went to politics and anything could have happened, I was comforted by the thought that the family 
would not self-destruct. But of course, crucial to the choice was the children. You are either like your mother, or you are like your father, or you are somewhere in between. <laughs> so I want to make quite sure, whichever way it is, like me, I can't change myself, like her, I can choose her. So in between... <laughs> In between, it can't be too bad. <laughs> and as luck would have it, three tosses of the coin, they all came out right. <laughs> but crucial also is a wife who's able to nurture the children. I I'm not against uh, feminism or the feminist movement, but I think there are certain biological differences which makes certain roles more suitable for mothers than for fathers. And bringing up children, nurturing them, giving them succor, comfort, encouragement is the mother's job. And if you get one of these wives like Kramer and Kramer, you know, the American film, I want to fulfill myself, then I would stay away from that woman. <laughs> Children have to be brought up with right values, right attitudes, filial, well-behaved, well-mannered, and to achieve honor for themselves and the family. Of course, as a father, you've got to spend time with them. Do not believe that children grow up by themselves and that you give them a few books and then they'll be all right. They're watching TV, they come up with jingles, they become products of the advertisers. <laughs> I've been reading the newspapers about the tremendous commotion lining up for primary schools. I think I ought to make a little point here. Schools are important, and good schools give a student an advantage. But primary schools do not, kindergartens, primary schools don't make all that much of a difference. It is in your formative years in secondary school, and in junior college, and in university, that it makes a difference. I went to Tulokrao English School as down off Still Road. Lots of Malay children, fishermen's children, Chinese fishermen's children, didn't do me any harm. Head Start programs may help, but finally it's your natural capacity. If you are 1,300 cc, however um, high octane fuel you put in, you're still 1,300 cc. <laughs> so if you are 2,005 or 3,000, then you can pour low octane fuel, it will still pour away. Of course, by the time you are entering the competitive stage, say upper secondary, then you want to make sure you've got high octane. So there is really no answer to this leveling of the playing field at primary school. We can level the playing field in secondary school because then you are allotted to the school by your results. Now, the next thing would be a house. Best, of course, if father and mother can give me one to start with. <clears throat> My children were fortunate. They had a mother who worked, and when they started life, they had a home. Not very posh, but comfortable, and they have been able to upgrade from a condominium to their own private bungalows. If I didn't have a father or a mother to give me that, I would start off with a five-room or an HDB executive. 
quickly before my income ceiling takes me beyond that. You buy a flat in Pishan for a thousand six is going today for half a million. So I would get there first, stay five years, seven years, and then move out. Now, car. What should I do? <laughs> <coughs> now, I think I would wait three to five years after graduation, then I'll buy a Japanese car, maybe 1,003 to 1,500 liters CC. That would be not bad. I put it in a sub objective way this, in this manner. However well educated you are, remember that only the top 260 or 270,000 people own cars. 31% of all households. This was from the 1992-93 household expenditure survey. Because houses and cars require land. There's no use having a car and putting it up on a jack and admiring it. You need land, roads. And land is of finite size. You can stretch it a bit by land reclamation. You can build roads above the ground, build tunnels under the ground, but there are limits. Let me tell you the facts about graduates. When I came out from university, I was one out of the top 1%. That's all that made it to university in my generation. When my son Lung came back in 74, he was one out of 3.8%. When my son Yang came back in 79, he was one out of 4.7%. Now you are part of 19%. By the time you graduate, you may be part of 21%. So, you see, the scarcity value of graduates goes down <laughs> and the scarcity value of land goes up. I'll give you uh, some reassurance about the prospects. Take your time, don't get an too anxious. However high they go, it does not matter. Can you get to the top 15%? or the top 20% or the top 23% because that is what decides who gets there. If you can get into the top 20% of wage earners, you will get the house because rich man's son gets house. He hasn't got the earning capabilities. After he lives well, then he has to sell house. <laughs> you buy it. <laughs> it's been like that from time immemorial. Now, profession or business? I would ask myself, and I would say, well, with my inclinations, I would branch out by the time I was about 40, 45, and either take a partnership or get something going on my own. But if I were average, then I would adjust my sights accordingly and move on career paths which will maximize my opportunities. Now I have a lot more to tell you Recreation, leisure, medical, benefits, CPF. <laughs> <coughs> what would I do? I probably want to be a member of a golf club, to have a swimming pool, a health club. I'd want to have uh, school holidays with my children abroad now, not just go up to Fraser's Hill or Cameron Highlands. They want to see uh, people take children to Disney World or Disneyland or whatever. New Zealand, Australia. 
exotic places in China, in Europe, and so on. But in your lifetime, you're going to see world-class concerts and plays in Singapore because we're going to put up the facilities for it and we're on the main trunk route. And whether you're Pavarotti or uh, Placido Domingo or whoever, they, they have to travel because Europe has heard enough of them and everybody's <laughs> watched them on television on television so they have to travel and they get up, they pick up a few hundred thousand dollars and million dollars each time so we are no longer isolated I cannot leave without mentioning this I think medical services I would go in for med either comprehensive co-payment or subsidized outpatient scheme but I will buy myself MediShield Plus and for my CPF, I'll put as much as I can because it's tax-free. I'll reach the maximum and put it by and use it to invest wisely and safely in blue chip stocks. Politics. That is my last subject. Would I go into politics? If I did not have a grandfather to advise me, I'd probably join the crowd and say, I look after myself. But if everybody looks after himself, then Singapore must go down. And when it goes down, that's finish. Because then you become an emigre. And if you have seen the Vietnamese, or you have seen uh, Singaporeans who have migrated, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, I've met them. I'd rather stay here and make this place work. So, what would I do? I think I'll catch the eye <coughs> of some minister. <laughs> and if I, if I have the right credentials, SAF scholarship, Overseas Merit Scholarship, preferably a first at a top university, an MBA with distinction. They cannot miss me, they'll be looking for me. But that only gets you an interview, a tea session. <laughs> then they got to know, what do you interrelate well? Have you got the right social intelligence? Have you got the right commitments now born in 1973 without that hardship the idealism I think will still be latent if you've got it otherwise you can't explain why people go to Rwanda you see them on television they go to Somalia, they go to Bosnia, you know, Medicine Sans Frontieres, Oxfam, all these uh, care and so on. They are able to find highly intelligent people, well qualified, driving lorries, catering for the miserable. And they cannot be doing it for money, it doesn't make sense. So we are also tapping that same wellspring of idealism. It's a powerful force for good. So SIF, Singapore International Foundation, gets people willing to go to Botswana, Nepal, Philippines, do things for other people. I, I believe I must have had some of that, otherwise I wouldn't have decided to fight both the British and then the Communists because it's a rather daunting prospect. I mean, you might get clubbed, not so much by the British, because by the time I fought them, they were, they were already on the way out. But I mean, if you take on the communists, it's a very serious business. They have assassination squads, and they're tough. Why I did it, I, w I cannot explain. I just decided that if we didn't do it, they would take over. That's finished for all of us. I live one life. 
I'm prepared to stake my life for a right to say what is to happen. And as luck would have it, it came out heads. Otherwise, I won't be here talking to you. <laughs> now, in the 19, <coughs> say 2010, 2015, I think I'll be ready to be a minister. And probably I'll stay minimum two terms, preferably three terms, to leave my mark. You can't really leave your mark in one term, four or five years, whether it's education, whether it's uh, trade and industry. It's not a deep imprint. But even if I go back to my own business, I want to stay on as an MP. This is something which the younger generation does not understand. There are 80 MPs, and in a crisis, everyone counts. I've been in such a crisis. In 1961, the PAP government had a majority of one. Without that, the history of Singapore would have been different. And one died. My colleague, the Minister for Labour, Ahmad Ibrahim, for whom this road was named, Ahmad Ibrahim Road, to Jurong, died. He had liver cirrhosis of the liver. So we were nicely balanced, 25-25. But we governed, and we knew that the opposition could not unite to defeat us. And that carried us right through to 1963, and we won the next elections. So, being an MP means, in a critical moment, having the right to say, look, you either take this course or that course. And you are in touch with events. But, of course, it also means, as the phrase goes, your Sundays are burnt, because that's the time when the constituents want to see you, and they are free. So therefore, you are not free. <clears throat> but that's life. You pay a price. But I would think it's a price worth paying. Now, what if I were not in the top 2-3% of my generation? And I'll tell you that I would not lose heart. I won't be discouraged because Many of the most successful men in the world never were at the top 2-3% of their generation, at least not the scholarship route. Henry Ford didn't get an MBA with distinction, neither did Rockefeller. And Sim Wong Hu of uh, Creative Technology, he only made Polytechnic. But he's got a good brain, and he's made it. So, what it really means is, can you get advice from your parents, from your uncles, from teachers, from friends, how to maximize your natural endowments, your gifts, the things you do well, and then seize your chances in a given society at a given stage of development. My chances were different. A whole world was in a stage of revolution. Empires were being dismantled. Empires had crashed with the Japanese occupation. You can't start a revolution now. <laughs> People will think you're mad. So you can't travel my path. But the whole of East Asia is opening up. This is one enormous big world which is going to be integrated. There are enormous opportunities. And if I were a young man, I would seize them. Now, if you tell me what you can do well, I may be able to tell you where you can best market your endowments. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Lee. Uh, my name is Lau Kok Kyung from NTU Accounts Year 2. 
Um, I, I noticed that the majority of your speech concentrates on scenario whereby the person you mentioned, right, in your view, is actually have a actually has a life like well made for him. No, it's something like <laughs> where he can easily get to um, any university that he wants because his parents has the money for it, or either he he can easily get uh, an SAF scholarship or things like that. Okay. Uh, with all due respect, I would like to say that going to a prestigious university like Yale or Harvard would cause a bomb to any ordinary family. So, um, does that mean that in your speech you will imply that there will be very little chance for undergraduates that doesn't have such opportunity open to them to play a major role in Singapore, like becoming a, a minister? <coughs> Let me phrase this in uh, honest but not offensive way. <laughs> Supposing, as I said just now, I can only make two B's and two C's and get into NTU or into NUS. I think I would do what you have done take up accountancy. <laughs> no. I, I mean that seriously. I mean that seriously. The business sector is going to grow in Singapore. The stock exchange will grow and that means you want good accountants and so all your financial specialists and analysts can work on records which they know have been vetted by people who have looked very thoroughly at the accounts. You make a very good living if you are good at it. But if you want to go into politics, you can make a very good MP. And I would not rule that out. We need a lot of soldiers are going to carry a heavy load because ministers cannot do all the work. The constituency has to be looked after. <laughs> Let me t tell you that I could not have done what I did over the last 30 years if I did not have MPs who took over part of my constituency work. But if you want to be a leader man, then you must take the hard knocks. And please remember, you elect duds, you get a dud government. And I'm sure many of my female counterparts would like to know if you can just stem from the perspective um, how different or how would it be from your perspective if you were a young female undergrad? Thank you. <laughs> well, it's an impossibility for me. But <laughs> uh, I'll try and put myself in that situation and I'm basing it on the statistics that I have read and the girls that I have met uh, in the government service and uh, in the professions that I come into contact with. If I were a young undergraduate of 21, I would know reading the statistics that the Singaporean male is a duffer and a fool. <laughs> He is the product of an outmoded set of values which makes him want to marry or have a wife who is seen to be his subordinate, or at least does not challenge him. And some mothers encourage that because they are a bit nervous dealing with well-educated daughter-in-laws. So I, I keep on telling such mothers, it, you do that, then when your daughter goes to university, please remember the chances are very high that she will remain unmarried. <laughs> <clears throat> but if I am a girl, I would set out quietly and assess the market.
some statistical figures make very compelling reading. It's a question of opportunities to meet and to interact. Knowing that four out of six males will reject you because you're a graduate. So that's a tough proposition. If you are a nurse or you're a doctor or a school teacher, that's the worst profession. Because you are a woman graduate school teacher, you meet fellow women graduate school teachers. Your principal is a fellow woman graduate school teacher. <laughs> How are you going to get married? <laughs> so, if you are going to take up teaching, I would say move whilst you are an undergraduate. <laughs> Make your friendships, get bonded, go study long before you become a teacher. Now it's a, it's a problem which will not go away for some time, but I think it's wise also not to rule out marrying somebody who isn't a graduate. So if you do try, I would say be realistic there is no such thing as an ideal match or an ideal bride, bridegroom. If you can get somebody who is not inferior to your brother or, or your cousin, settle for that. <laughs> because the chances are, whatever you may think of yourself, the man probably thinks, well, you're not different from his sister, or his cousins. I think a realistic approach to this problem is very necessary. But of course, I have not yet solved this problem, and I'm not sure that my successors can. It's going to take a long time. So in the meantime, those of you who are in that age group, readjust your thinking. Time goes very fast. You are in your 20s now, you think you got all the time in the world. Once you reach the 30s, you still think you got time, but <laughs> before you know it, it's foreclosed. You have mentioned that uh, you might consider again before giving a uh, woman equal opportunities in tertiary education. But, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if women are not given equal opportunities in tertiary education, it might affect the workforce, though giving women equal tertiary education might or have really affected the birth rate. So uh, what, what would you <coughs> choose? <laughs> now you mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me put this in perspective. Giving women tertiary education is not affecting the birth rate. It's affecting the demographic quality of the population. This question arose and has been misunderstood when I spoke to some Australians in Sydney. If I had my cards to play again from 1959, I would have played it differently. Because I've seen the results and I knew I know now that we were ignorant and we were simplistic. We thought we open up the whole system, equal opportunities for education, for jobs, and we'll become like the West. We forgot that culture does not change rapidly. Culture goes with mother's milk. Your mother implants ideas in you. So you want to be the boss in the family. You don't want a wife who's smarter than you and earning more than you. Now, had we known this, we would have done what the Japanese did. And their economy never suffered. They sent all their smart girls to finishing colleges. 
that courses are as tough as the universities. But they did not pose a challenge to the Japanese male because it's called finishing college. They learn economics, they learn languages, they learn lots of useful things to become good counterparts of their husbands, good hostesses to help the husband's career and to bring up the next generation. So they restricted entry to the university before to 10%. Now they've loosened up to 20%. And they do not face the same problem so severely. So if I could go back to 1959, I would have done the same thing. Gradual opening up and re-education of the male and of mothers. Every year, we do a statistical breakdown of the qualifications, educational qualifications of the fathers and mothers of the top 10% of PSLE students, O levels, A levels. Quite simple. This is across the whole population. And where mother and father is a graduate, they predominate. Out of all, pro I'm not saying that two laborers cannot produce a graduate or a top PSLE student, but as a percentage of that group, it is this small compared to this big. If you don't believe me, we've got the records since 1983 when we started it. Uh, so, I would say, we have got here, we can't unscramble the egg, we go on, there's tremendous attrition and waste every year, is 40% at the moment, well not really because some 10 or 15% are marrying below them. So that leaves about 25%, 25-30% unmarried. But it's still a waste. And uh, if I could go back and zoom back in time, like one of these uh, sky-fi books, then I would play it a different way. But I did not have the knowledge, neither did my young colleagues. We were all young, equally ignorant. I never suffered from that complex. In fact, very fortunately for me, I went out of my way to look for one who is smarter than me. <laughs> Just in case. Can't go wrong. Either way, if it's like me, well, I can't help it. But if it's like her, then it's better than me. I win, heads double up. <laughs> I'd like to ask you about the scheme that you've proposed, uh, perhaps for the future of Singapore, where you spoke of the one man, two vote system. I would just like to ask um, if you feel that we are perhaps exchanging a tyranny of the geriatric for the tyranny of the middle age, considering the fact that uh, many sections, uh, considering the fact that some sections of uh, the younger population have been clamoring for uh, policies which uh, may not be that conducive to the polity in the future. I have seen what has happened to the system in other parts of the world. You have seen and it's malfunctioning in America where single issues, lobbies, railroad policies through because they are organized and they are not in the interests of the country. I've seen it happen in Britain. Uh, I've seen it is happening now in Germany. If we leave the system as it is, then in 20, 30 years, 25 at the outside, we are going to have a lot of very old people who would insist on taking their CPF out at 55 and we know that they are not making provisions which they ought to 
for the next at least 20 years, probably 25 years, because the span of life is now already over 75. So one way of that, one way of, of overcoming these problems would be to invest the vote more heavily on those who have to bring up their children. Because when you have to, when you bring children into the world, you cannot vote just for yourself. There are two ways of looking. To justify it, I mean, I've tossed this to get people thinking about the problem. And before I, in fact, uh, the reporters who went with me to Australia asked me this question after my Sydney speech. So I decided, no, don't report it first. Let me think it over. And I circulated, circulated it to some of my colleagues. I said, this will stir up a hornet's nest. But it's a problem that has to be faced. So they said, if you don't commit us, go ahead. So I released it. I give a simple illustration of what would happen to Singapore if we went along this course and went along like America or Britain. The agent becomes organized. Must do. It's quite simple. You get all of all the senior citizens' corners in no time. You got 20%, 25% of the vote. And free medical health, free this, free that. I tell you what will happen. In Britain, and in, in, it, it has already happened, it happened in Mrs. Thatcher's time. British professionals left because of the high taxes. Doctors leave for America. Engineers who work for companies like Shell, who are also based in Holland, got themselves domiciled in Holland, so they pay Dutch income tax, which was lower. So they pay less tax in Britain. So Mrs. Thatcher started retrenching, but she can't. You lose votes. You can't retrench. We are not into that position yet. And my advice to Singapore is, don't ever get into that position. You can't unwind it. If all the productive people leave, who is going to push this economy forward and pay the big taxes? They are people between the 35 to 60 age group. You want to be kind, start at 30. The moment you have a child, you, I'm prepared to say, okay, even at 25, if you want to be generous, I don't think they're fully mature yet at 25, but if they have children, maybe they start thinking about it. They are at their most productive. They will pursue policies that will ensure a future for their children. It's not urgent, but think about it, because I may not be around to suggest these solutions. <laughs> and I do not think it's that uh, illogical or that unjust. It's completely fair. It goes through for everybody. Nobody is deprived of it. The day you bring a child into the world, I give you two votes. And the chances are they will not do foolish things. Now you think about it, you can fault it right to me. Thank you so much, sir. On Talking Point. Your crowning glory. You could lose it, but can you regain it? Hair loss. What can you really do about it? They're at an age when most are ready to take a break, but instead of enjoying their retirement at rest, they're enjoying it at work. 
elderly workers. Who are they and why do they keep on working? On Talking Point, 8 p.m. Wednesday on 5, after Candid Camera. At 11, it's your Saturday night movie, Son of Darkness, rated PG. And then it's the outrageous Benny Hill Show. So stay with us on 5 tonight. do with leftover paint, used oil, and old car batteries? Well, the Humboldt County Office of Environmental Health has a new way to get rid of some old hazardous waste. Joining me in the studio this evening is... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you do change your mind, you know you have a place to stay. Honey. Honey. Oh. <laughs> By implication, all the others are true because you brought your mind to bear on it. The trouble with him is he's too clever by half. He always forgets what he said in his last letter. But it's not Dr. Chi we are beating up. We are beating up in the argument the people who want to make use of him. American human rights groups, the American media who think that we ought to change. Gave a strong defense of the judiciary. He said between 1959 and 1990, he was responsible for appointing all judges of the Supreme Court. He was very thorough in his selection for judicial appointments because they were for life. The main attributes that he looked for were integrity, ability, qualifications and suitability for the job. If I had indulged in nepotism and cronyism, Singapore would not be what it is today. With a government, a civil service, a police force, a whole structure of an establishment which is admitted, acknowledged, not just by businessmen, but even by foreign correspondents who do not much favor us to be squeaky clean. In other words, honest, efficient, and fair. Where rules cannot be circumvented by gifts and money politics does not exist. It was the Singapore Democratic Party's decision to attend an alternative panel discussion at Williams College in September that led to the motion. Prime Minister Go Chok Tong had gone to his alma mater, Williams College in Massachusetts, to receive an honorary degree. SDP Secretary General accepted an invitation to attend the alternative panel discussion at the college organized by those opposed to Prime Minister Go's award. At the discussion, fugitive lawyer Francis Xiao attacked the independence and integrity of Singapore's judiciary and legal system. In his hour-long defense of the judiciary, Mr. Lee said he took the utmost care to appoint the right people as judges. He then went on to speak about his appointment of the first Singaporean Chief Justice here in 1963. The person I appointed Mr. Justice Wee Chong Jin was already a High Court judge, appointed by a previous governor, and he held his appointment by letters patent from the British Queen. So his qualification to be a judge was not based on my criteria, but on the governor's criteria in the days before elected governments. I elevated him from the bench to the Chief Justiceship. He stayed on as Chief Justice from 1963 to 1990. Many judgments went against the government. He was never removed. He reached retirement age. I extended it twice because there was no suitable alternative. 
Mr. Lee also explained how he came to appoint Mr. Yong Pang Hao as Chief Justice. One of my most important last appointments before I retired was to appoint the Chief Justice to succeed Chief Justice Wee Chong Jin. I weighed the merits of several candidates. I discussed the matter with all the judges separately. Each of the judges listed for me the three best persons he considered for the office. He considered suitable for the office, always excluding himself. With each judge, I separately went through the list of members of the Singapore Bar. I considered several outstanding lawyers from the Malaysian Bar and looked at a few possibles elsewhere, including Hong Kong. I rediscussed the matter with the four judges who knew Mr. Yong Pang Hao well. They all rated him the best of the possibles. Chief Justice Yong and Mr. Lee were fellow students for three years at the Cambridge Law School from 1946. He returned and practiced law both in Malaysia and Singapore for 20 years. In 1970, when he was, he was already, when he was already the head of one of the largest law firms in both countries, Singapore and Malaysia, Shuklin and Bok, which had been started by his father, himself a lawyer, he decided to leave the law for banking. He became the head of the merchant bank symbol and later a director and vice chairman of our largest local bank, the Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation. In April 1981, Dr. Go Keng Sui asked the OCBC, then finance minister, no, then doing a special job for me to form the Government Investment Corporation. And he had Mr. Lim Kim Sun as the first managing director. Who had he decided in April 1981 to ask OCBC to lend him for the Government Investment Corporation as managing director, Yong Pang Hao. He had known him separately as a banker. Later, he became also managing director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore because his competence was beyond doubt. As chairman GIC, I could see from his work that he was the same Yong Pang Hao I had known as a student, thorough, meticulous, and scrupulously fair in his, in his presentation of the alternatives for investment projects before expressing his preferences. That's a very important quality for a judge. In 1989, Mr. Lee asked Mr. Yong to consider the offer of Chief Justice, telling him that it would be Mr. Lee's last appointment before his retirement. Mr. Yong asked for time to consider it. If he agreed, he would have to take up an appointment as judge of the Supreme Court for a year before he became, he took up his appointment as Chief Justice. So as chairman of OCBC, in the first six months of 1989, he earned $1.3 million from his salary, bonuses and pay in lieu of leave. In other words, if he had stayed on in OCBC, he would have earned $2.6 million for the whole of 1989. The previous year, 1988, he had earned $1.3 million. 
because it was a less prosperous year for the bank with smaller bonuses. These were cash payments, excluding his entitlements to share options. As a judge of the Supreme Court, he would receive, and in fact did receive, for the second six months of 1989, the princely sum of $0.177 million. $177,000. Less than one-seventh of his OCBC remuneration for the first six months. He considered it carefully for a month and told me that he would accept the appointment. He left OCBC and was appointed judge of the Supreme Court on the 1st of July, 1989. In September 1990, when Chief Justice Wee Chong Jin retired, I appointed him Chief Justice. Mr. Yong Pong House's integrity, ability, and standing were already well established amongst bankers, both in Singapore and internationally. He's not an unknown person, like Mr. Francis Xiao. He is known to people who deal in billions of dollars of investments as a man of honor. And in London, he is, amongst London bankers, a respected figure. In the last five years, he has earned the respect of the bar, not as my friend, but as the Chief Justice. More than 200 of his judgments in the last five years have been published in our law reports. They are there for all to read and to judge. It is absurd for anyone to suggest that a man would give up his position as chairman of our largest bank, earning more than $2.6 million a year, to become a compliant chief justice for less than one-fifth the salary. He undertook the job as a matter of duty. Mr. Lee noted that money did not matter to Chief Justice Yong so much because he had inherited wealth. But the senior minister pointed out that Singapore cannot in future depend on finding a Chief Justice who happened to be good and had integrity and judicial temperament while at the same time inherited wealth. And because of that, I Mr. Lee said, there was a need for a fundamental revision of salaries from the President downwards, the including the Chief Justice, the, the Judges and the Civil Servants. If Singapore is to remain squeaky clean, when that revolutionary generation that threw me and my colleagues up cannot be reproduced, this is the only way. Face the alternatives and we will avoid the discomfiture of many other countries. Every time your constituent asks you, why should the minister be paid so much? Tell him, the minister handles in billions of dollars. One signature from the minister can make or break a company, not just a man. Therefore, he must be a man of that quality, that standing, that integrity. And if he is not worth 60% of what his private sector counterparts are getting, he should not be holding that job. Settle for Francis Xiao or Dr. Chi Sun Chuan. All you need to do is to pay for his wife's postage to send the PhD thesis for correction. It's cheap. I've never needed the courts to deal with troublesome problems which I can deal with by executive decision 
under the law in order to be able to act against subversives or criminals like drug traffickers against whom there is insufficient evidence for a court of law without having recourse to the courts. In other words, I was my own carrier of a hatchet. I needed no hatchet man. All those who have dealt with me know that I've never flinched from going into a dark street on a dark night and it happens to be a cul-de-sac. No outlet. Either the gangster or I will come out alive. I have done this a few times. I'm prepared to do this again. But when the government, including me, when I take a matter to a court, or when the government is taken by private individuals to court, then the court must adjudicate upon the issues strictly on their merits and in accordance with the law. To have it otherwise is to lose us our standing and to lose us our, invest, our status as an investment and financial center. Fortune magazine is owned by Time Warner. We have banned or we have restricted Time magazine for refusing to publish our replies. We are no favorites of Time Warner. But they carried out two independent surveys and they rated Singapore number one investment center. The interpretation of documents, of contracts in accordance with the law is crucial. And because of that, the senior minister said, it is important to have good people to serve on the bench. Mr. Lee said Chief Justice Yong has been careful, meticulous and thorough in his selection of judicial appointees. When he became judge in 1989, he met a large cross-section of lawyers and leading members of the bar. He found out those who were highly respected, of whom he shortlisted 60 candidates. Within a year before he became Chief Justice, he had narrowed the list to 20. He based his selection on the academic background of the person and how the market and the bar viewed him or her. He also sought the views of each of the judges and judicial commissioners on the overall integrity, legal ability and likely judicial temperament of these persons. From 1992, he refined the selection process by a quiet poll every 12 to 15 months. In Mr. Lee's view, these appointments and the changes made to the court's administration over the past five years have raised the morale, efficiency and effectiveness of the officers of our courts. Despite the integrity of the Singapore bench and open judgments in the courts, there are baseless attacks on the integrity of the judges who remain unintimidated. So what is all this about? From time to time, since 1989, 1987, American human rights groups like Asia Watch and through Asia Watch, the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, have made baseless and scurrilous allegations that our judiciary is not independent. It all started in 1987 over the Marxist conspirators' arrest. When we were not intimidated by the attacks on us for using the Inter Internal Security Act, we refused to yield. So they went out on a vendetta and a crusade. And so they got the American Bar Association in the city of New York to visit Singapore and come up with a report. So are we intimidated, Mr. Lee asked? Now, the SDP through his Secretary General, Dr. Chi Sun Chuan, has endorsed this allegation, cleverly using, or he thought cleverly, using what Francis Xiao and Christopher Lingle said at the alternative panel discussion at Williams College. 
He did not utter these words. He just happened to be present. But he denied other things which were untrue, like chewing gum with a thousand dollar fine, or smoking, carrying death penalty. That's untrue. There's a Latin tag which says, expressio unius, exclusio altarius. When you list out the items which you say are untrue, by implication, all the others are true because you've brought your mind to bear on it. The trouble with him is he's too clever by half. He always forgets what he said in his last letter. But it's not Dr. Chi we are beating up. We are beating up in the argument the people who want to make use of him. Can he change the system? Is he ever likely to get an alternative group of men to put forward to Singapore as a shadow cabinet that they could vote in? Is anybody joining him of any quality since his hunger strike in 1993? Who then are we bucking? American human rights groups, the American media who think that we ought to change. We have succeeded by the free market system which they espouse. We have benefited from the system of laws, the stability which they have ensured. Therefore, we must be the ideal development country. We shouldn't deviate and form a different kind of system. They want the whole of Asia and eventually the whole of the world to be ideal societies like them. They argue, they fight, they contend. They have marches where the blacks gather in Washington, one million strong, and demand justice for all the horrors inflicted upon the blacks for hundreds of years. That's democracy. We prefer to approach our problems a different way. And that when way, according to Mr. Lee, is doing things in a realistic in way, not by argument and debate. And he's confident that in five years we will know if our more sedate but truthful presentation of news and facts is better than the free press system in the Philippines, the Taiwan, South Korea and Thailand. If we were a crook outfit, a rogue outfit. If in fact the Chief Justice is a crony of mine and all the judges are his cronies who will do his bidding, would we bring this debate into this house and add we'd be hiding in a corner. But the appointments made can bear scrutiny. What have we to be ashamed of? I'm not ashamed of Singapore. I'm not ashamed for having arrested Francis Xiao or sanctioning his arrest under ISA to discover and confirm that an American diplomat had egged him on to get a group of lawyers to contest the elections and get into parliament and defeat and break up the monopoly of the PAP. This American diplomat had admitted helping Cory Aquino to get into power in the Philippines. But leave us alone, please, Mr. Lee said. Our people are not stupid. When they vote, they know that if they vote wrongly, and they really vote out the PAP government and vote in the opposition, what would happen to them? And I think it's perfectly legitimate, legitimate for the PAP government to say the choice is yours.
but the American human rights groups and media wanted us to follow Remember their system, where every Singapore step the president takes is contested and contended. But I suggest to this House that we do a lot better because we are differently constituted. I am convinced that at the end of 10 years, we will be doing a lot better, despite all the troubles we'll get from Asia Watch, American Bar Association, City of New York, or the Harvard Law School giving a postal address for Francis Xiao. You may impress Americans with that postal address, but you have not changed the nature of Francis Xiao and who he is and what he is with Singaporeans. And so I noted with great interest that Mr. Chi distanced himself from Francis Xiao. He didn't go on the same platform. He wanted to keep his distance. He didn't want to be treated like Francis Xiao. He knows that that carries no credits, no votes in Singapore. Now, if Francis Xiao were a Nelson Mandela, how different it would be. We have invited the Prime Minister in his uh, letter, the through the Ambassador, come back. We want him back. Face his charges. Maximum a few months jail. A fighter for freedom to change the whole system. Intimidated by a few months jail, which will make him into a martyr and rally the masses behind him to overthrow the system. Instead, he sends little letters in the press from the safety and the refuge of America. I believe we must expect this to continue and we will do well every time we read it. And after a while, I believe also that our neighbors have taken note of what has happened, as indeed you can see from the newspapers, editorials from Bangkok, from Jakarta, that when William Safar was invited to Singapore for an open debate, he chose not to come. And so, Dr. so was Dr. Crane. I had always been under the impression that they were the ones who were for an exchange of views. And who did they want to convince? Williams College students about the future of Singapore? or Singaporeans about the future of Singapore. And that is what is at stake. So, let us not forget that in the midst of this debate, we are talking about our future. We are not interested really in how America is run, but we are profoundly interested in whether we are making the right steps forward for ourselves. And I believe it is not in our interest to have it said that our judges are compliant and corrupt. Thank you. The debate on the motion in Parliament continued for a second day on Friday, during which a division was called. Of those in Parliament, only SDP MPs Ling Hao Dung and Chiu Chai Chien did not support the motion, and Workers' Party Lo Tia Kiang abstained.
for our next exciting destination, we go to Istanbul, Turkey. Come with us into the heart of this city and see what makes it tick. Find out about the sport that many of them take seriously. Get a real feel of their exotic lifestyle in the city that straddles both Asia and Europe on Monday, 10 p.m., Channel 5.